In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. <coughs> Today is Easter Monday. This whole week, as I said before, is one huge Easter day. And today we contemplate this very beautiful account of two disciples who are walking back from Jerusalem and going back home. It's about seven and a half miles walk. They knew the apostles, they knew all the disciples, and uh, they were there probably in the crowds to see our Lord's condemnation, his scourging at the pillar, Pontius Pilate washing his hands, saying, I'm innocent of the guilt of this man. So Pontius Pilate, the liberal, hands him over to the savagery of the Jews. And the Jews uh, mock and kick and spit at and throw rocks at Christ all the way to Calvary. And the Romans, Longinus, the Roman soldier who's in charge of the procession towards Calvary, takes Christ and the two thieves carrying their cross through the streets of Jerusalem. One of the mystics says that the, the passage to, to the, from the Praetorium where Pontius Pilate was to Calvary wasn't all that far. They just had to go straight out the street, through the walls of the heaven of Jerusalem, up the mountain to Calvary. But according to one of the mystics, <clears throat> our Lord told her that the fury of the Jews was so um, vehement, so rabid, that the Jews blocked the streets that would have made the the passageway to Calvary much shorter. So the Jews blocking the streets made the, path, the way of the cross much longer. And finally, Longinus, the Roman soldier, had enough of the Jews' uh, games, and he, he forced his way through the streets, straight to Calvary, outside the gates to, the, to Calvary. So our Lord, he, on this day, this was Easter afternoon, so it would have been Easter Sunday towards evening, walking seven miles, so you're probably talking around, maybe around one o'clock, our Lord joined with the two, two, the two disciples. One of them is Cleophas. And they're walking, and this stranger walks up to them. And they just think, well, it's another pilgrim, because in those days, most people walked. And Jerusalem was very crowded that weekend, and all the events of Christ's passion, it was in the earthquake, and the, the ghosts of the prophets walking through the streets, cursing the Jews for killing the true Messiah. <clears throat> they saw the bodies of the prophets walking through the streets, and uh, the bloody red moon on Good Friday night that rose that night and uh, the astronomers can calculate that the moon on that Good Friday night was actually bloody red and big, full moon on Good Friday night. Holy Saturday, uh, people, all of the people left, the people left Jerusalem very fast because they were scared by all the events. The tremendous earthquake, the darkness for three hours, an eclipse for three hours, well, Christ hung on the cross from noon to three. All these events were tremendous. And then Pontius Pilate being kind of in the middle of it, the wickedness of the high priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees who were mocking Christ at the foot of the cross, and then his sacred death on the cross, his burial. So listen to what these two disciples are saying. Listen to their state of mind. And it's a big temptation for many Catholics also today to be like them. Listen to what they say. <clears throat> Jesus, drawing near to them, walked with them, but their eyes were held that they should not know him. And so he said to them, What are, you, what are these discourses that you hold one with another as you walk, and why are you sad? 
<clears throat> so in other words, what are you talking about on this long trip? And why, why do you men look so sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered to him, saying, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem that has not known the things that have been done here in these days? And then Jesus says to him, What things? So they're walking these seven long miles, and they're telling him about, our, about this man, Jesus of Nazareth, <clears throat> all his miracles, all his words, and notice what they're saying here. And they said about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet. Notice the past tense. Who was a prophet. Mighty in work and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and princes delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But, listen to this. But we had hoped that it was he that should have redeemed Israel. Do you think they kept the faith? They lost the faith? We hoped he was the Messiah. We hoped he was the Son of God. We hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. But he's dead now. It's over. And now, besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yes, and certain women also of our company scared us, who, before it was light, went to the sepulchre, and not finding his body, they came, saying that they had also seen visions of angels, who say that he is alive. And of course, these two disciples don't believe these women. They just think, well, these women didn't have enough sleep. It's obvious, they don't believe them. And some of our people, the disciples go on to say, Cleophas, and some of our people, the disciples, went to the sepulchre and found it so as the women had said, but they did not find him. Then he said to them, so now they're walking and our Lord is listening, they don't know it's our Lord walking with them these long miles. And our Lord is listening to them very patiently. And then our Lord speaks. He's the stranger that they think he's... They don't know why he doesn't know what's going on. Then Christ speaks and he says, O oh, foolish, in Latin, stulti, O oh, oh, stupid, O oh, foolish and slow of heart, to believe in all the things which the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and so to enter his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, ex he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things that were concerning him. So this was very typical of the Jews. The Jews, uh, they knew the scriptures, the Pharisees knew the scriptures, they were supposed to know the scriptures very well. But the Jews only saw the scriptures, they only saw, we would say, the positive side of the Redeemer. That he would be great and powerful. And he would come with power and majesty on the clouds of heaven. That he would have fire going before his throne and millions of angels as his servants. But the true Messiah, as Christ himself said to Pontius Pilate, my father could send legions of angels to defend me. But this is the hour of darkness. And so uh, the, the apostles and the Jews, they forgot the passages of the prophecies of our Lord's great suffering. And this is part of our redemption, the suffering of our Lord. The, the bleeding of Christ the King through his wounds on the cross. These are the fountains of our life, of our soul. The five wounds of Christ are the fountains. And this is what's sung on every Sunday now until Pentecost. The Vidiaqua. I saw water gushing from the right side of the temple. And all those who came were, were made clean and washed. 
And the temple is, if you remember, Christ said, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. And the Jews were thinking, well, he's blaspheming. It took 48 years to build this temple. They were thinking of the physical temple in Jerusalem. But Christ was pointing to his body. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the water gushing from the right side of the temple of his body is the sacred heart of Jesus opened on the cross gushing forth to those who thirst for him come to me all you who thirst and I will refresh you and that is the love of Jesus Christ the grace of the sacraments especially of Holy Communion especially of Holy Confession which heals the wounds of sin and washes away the sins of the soul and Holy Communion, which is really His blood. You drink His blood in Holy Communion. Your mouth is stained with His blood, and the devils see that. Says St. John Chrysostom, they see you leave the communion rail stained with the blood of the Lamb, and they flee, they, they fly away. Because you carry in the, the living body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And this is the love of our, our God, the true God, that He wants to be united to us, like the flame and the wick of the candle. He wants to be united to us by sanctifying grace. And that's what it means to live. We hear a lot about living and life and vibrance and, and uh, imminence. But the true meaning that God means is that you live in the state of grace. That's to live. And those who live in mortal sin and choose to live in mortal sin, unrepented, unrepentant, non-confessed, not even want to confess, they live in the darkness. Their souls are wrapped by snakes and crawling with maggots. And St. John Bosco could often see that in his boys. He could see their souls and he could see them, you know, with frog, fat frogs strangling them or apes apes suffocating them, snakes around their whole body. He could see that and say, you know, come here, Fred, time to go to confession. And so he saw the, the grip of Satan on the souls. And that's the true freedom that our Lord came to bring. We hear again a lot of talk about freedom, freedom, liberty, but all that is meaningless unless we understand the true freedom, which is Freedom from the slavery to sin. Freedom from the death sentence that we have written on ourselves to burn forever in hell by living in mortal sin. So, uh, the apostles, they forgot the sufferings of this divine king. They forgot the passage of Isaiah, that he would look like a leper from head to foot. They forgot the passage of Isaiah, chapter 62. Why are your garments all red and your garments like those that tread the winepress splashed with blood as Christ was splashed with blood at the scourging and also um, they have pierced my hands and my feet they have numbered all my bones and other passages this is from Isaiah chapter 53 he will be despised the most abject of men the man of sorrows, the man of sorrows. And the Virgin Mary, she knew that, the, that the, her son, when she held him in, the, in her arms and nursed him as a baby, she knew these prophecies were pointing to him. And he would be this one butchered, the leper as one struck by God and afflicted, Isaiah. He is as, as a sheep led to the slaughter. He shall be as mute, silent as a lamb before his shearer, and he shall not open his mouth. He will be cut off out of the land of the living. For the wickedness of my people have I struck him. The words of God the Father. For the wickedness of my people, of the whole human race, I have struck my own loving divine son, struck him on the cross. And the Lord was pleased to bruise him in infirmity, and he shall lay down his life for sin. He was reputed among the wicked, 
He was crucified between two thieves. All these prophecies. And the Jews forgot these. They will look upon him whom they transfixed. A bone of his they shall not break. These are all the prophecies. And they shall cast dice over my garments. Upon my vestments they shall cast lots. And I will be betrayed. The betrayal of Judas was also foretold. So all the prophecies of Christ's brutal crucifixion and death, these they forgot. And so these two disciples, they hear our Lord. They still don't know that it's our Lord walking with them. But then our Lord is telling them about Moses. And he probably certainly brought up, you know, don't you remember reading in Moses when Moses raised up the brazen serpent on the tree? And all the Israelites had been bit by snakes. And all of them were dying by the thousands, just dying in the desert. And God told Moses, take, melt down brass. So the ladies gave their earrings and their bracelets. Melt it all down and make a brazen serpent, a serpent shaped out of bronze, and raise it up on the tree and hold it up for all to see. And anyone who looks upon that serpent on a tree, they will be saved. And certainly our Lord explained this. And so how would this prefigure Christ crucified? Because the tree, of course, is the cross. The serpent is bronze because Christ became a worm for us and not a man, Psalm 21. I became a worm to be stepped on and crushed by, by our sins. And St. Paul also says that Christ became sin for us. He became sin for us. He, he was like sin personified. So God unleashed, the Father unleashed the, the wrath, the anger of God on His divine Son for us. So He took the death sentence for us. So He was mangled, crucified, butchered, crowned with thorns, scourged at the pillar, beaten to, to the pole. And, but notice the brazen serpent. <coughs> It's bronze, so it doesn't have the poison in his... He doesn't have the venom of poison. Because Christ, although he was made sin for us, he himself was innocent. He had no sin. He's God. He has no sin. He was pure, immaculate, without stain. So he had no sin, no poison of him of sin. But he became sin for us on the tree of the cross. And so our Lord certainly would explain that. No doubt. And he certainly would have explained many other things for perhaps Daniel being persecuted for the, for the true faith. He was a Jew, a Jew before Christ came. The Jewish religion was the true religion before Christ came. And Daniel was persecuted, falsely, unjustly condemned, and sentenced to death by being put in the lion's den. Like Christ being unjustly sentenced by the, his own brothers, the Jews, whom he came to redeem, was sentenced to be put in the lion's den. And the lion's... Daniel was untouched, but Christ was torn up by the lions of the passion through his suffering. But then after, after, the, after the time in the pit, the king came to find Daniel dead, but Daniel was alive. And he said, Hail, king! And the lions around him were sleeping. They didn't devour him. And so that also prefigured Christ's resurrection, who would come out of the pit of death and rise from it glorious. So all the scriptures, all of it, in some way points to Jesus Christ. All the whole Old Testament, all the human history before Christ prepares for Christ. And so <clears throat> they're walking, and the, these two disciples listen, and they... They still don't know it's our Lord. And then, the, and then they come to their house. They come to a fork in the road. And the sign says, you know, welcome to Emmaus. Emmaus. E-M-M-A-U-S. That's their town. 
So they're going home and they realize it's getting close to supper time and towards night. And uh, notice the two disciples have, they learned from our Lord that we must love one another really with the true love of God. They heard our Lord say this many times. They saw our Lord show it. So at least they learned that. And so they have, they see this is a, a traveler. He needs a place to stay. He needs food. They just walked all in the heat of the day, seven miles. Why don't you stay with us? It's easy. <coughs> Come and stay with us. And our Lord blesses their charity. He blesses their hospitality. Because they could have gone and said, all right, see you later. Nice to meet you. Nice talking. But they would not have fulfilled the command of our Lord to, to, to pursue hospitality. Pursue hospitality. So our Lord takes the invitation. He goes to their house. He comes into their home. He certainly, our Lord being, you know, charity himself, he would have greeted the family, the father, the mother, the grandparents, the uncles and aunts, and all the little children. And finally, the bell rang for supper. It was time for dinner. They give an honor place to their guests. And the two disciples are entranced with him. Their hearts are on fire. They, they've heard all our Lord's words. And then, as they say later, our hearts were burning within us. He revived in them the, the faith. And then our Lord comes and they, they respect him, so they allow him to lead the grace. And then our Lord takes the bread, and these two disciples, they probably saw our Lord when he worked the miracle of the loaves on the mountain for 5,000 <coughs> men and, and uh, the 4,000 as well. And our Lord always did that s strange action that they didn't know the Jews, which was to make the sign of the cross. Because the sign of the cross, remember, for the, for the Romans was capital punishment. It's like the electric chair today. Sticking, sticking an electric chair everywhere. Our Lord put the sign of the cross over the bread to show the blessing. And the, these two disciples recognized that action. And suddenly their eyes are open. They receive the grace of the Holy Ghost to realize this is our Lord. And they see the wounds in His hands. And our Lord, right when they recognize that it's our Lord, and they, they're in awe our Lord vanishes from their sight. So they recognize Him in the breaking of the bread after the blessing. And that's why at Mass, the priest does these actions. He blesses the host before consecration. He bless, After the consecration, He makes five signs of the cross. Immediately after the consecration, five signs of the cross which don't bless anymore because God is there on the altar, but point out the five wounds. That's what the five signs of the cross symbol point to. The five wounds of Christ <laughs> is sacrificed on the altar. And those five wounds pour out the fountains of grace to those who are thirsty. So these two disciples, they look at each other, their families wondering, what kind of guest did you bring into the house? And they explain that didn't you see his wounds? That was our Lord. Didn't you remember? And they all recover the faith. And these two, the two apostles are so excited, they run. Mom will be back tomorrow for dinner. They run all the way back to Jerusalem. Seven miles marathon back. They get to Jerusalem. The apostles have more reports. Peter had already seen our Lord. And the apostles... Uh, and rising up, they went back the same hour to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven gathered together. Notice the eleven. Judas is not there. By this time, Thomas is back. Thomas doesn't believe. He's a rationalist. He doesn't believe our Lord rose from the dead. So he'll stay a modern, skeptical, modern philosophy rationalist until next week. A week after, then our Lord will appear again to the apostles. And those that were with him say, The Lord is indeed, he's risen, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told them what had done and how they recognized him at the 
breaking of the bread. And so at the Mass, that's what happens. The priest later in the Mass breaks the consecrated host. And that, that sound of the breaking draws, should draw your mind to Christ breaking, of spilling his blood on the cross, being broken on the cross by death. That separation of, of the blood and the body on the cross is, is expressed by the separation of the host and the precious blood at the Mass. That separation brings death, and that's the death of the sacrifice of the Mass offered in the, in the Holy Mass. It's dead, it symbolizes his death, but it's alive, because Christ is truly there. He's alive, present on the altar, in the Holy Eucharist. So let us ask, uh, the great love of the Mass, the great love of Jesus crucified and risen from the dead, and uh, remember these two disciples, it's very similar to now. See, see, the Catholic Church has to live the life of our Lord. And the Catholic Church has to come to the hour of its being betrayed, being agonizing, being crucified. The Catholic Church must live the life of our Lord. It's, it's a mystery of God, but it must. So it's given to us. To have the grace to live in the time when the Catholic Church is being betrayed and being mocked and ridiculed and being crucified by her very own bishops and priests who should be defending him. And you know, it's, it's common knowledge now that the communists infiltrated into the seminaries in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. And it was a deliberate, for example, a deliberate thing to exclude the good men who wanted to give their life to be good priests. And they brought in all these uh, uh, so, so, so and so's, the fifis, and they let them come into the seminaries who later became seminary professors and priests and bishops. And they, their intention was to bring the Catholic Church down from within. And that's why, that's part of the reason for all the horrible scandals uh, with the regards to the impurity and the virtue of chastity. So, and, 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 and of course the bad doctrine of Vatican II, which is permeated throughout the whole church, the poison of modernism. And most priests today, many, many priests don't even believe in the Holy Eucharist. And as I said before, we can even wonder if this Pope now really believes in the Holy Eucharist. He doesn't even genuflect at his own Mass. <laughs> and I don't think he has you know, crippled knees. <laughs> so it's very serious, the crisis. And so it's a temptation for many traditional Catholics to say, you know, now we've got this crisis now within the Society of St. Pius X. And I've already heard people say, I don't want to go back to the masses in the hotels and garages and living rooms. I went through all that 40 years ago. They're tired. And uh, I think that is a big temptation for many priests, for many faithful, to get tired of the war. We've been in this battle, some of you longer than even some of us. You've been in the battle since Vatican II. And some of you, the youngsters, uh, are new to the battle, but I think a lot are growing tired, but we're in another stage of the war, and we must not grow tired. We must not. We must pick up the weapons and fight on. This is what God wants of us. You may, we may not die seeing the, the glory of the church's resurrection. Maybe you will. Maybe you will. The triumph of Our Lady. It is prophesied it's going to happen. We might live to see it, but God knows. But all we know now is the church is in the worst crisis ever. The SSPX is now being infiltrated from the top, from within. It's being in, in, uh, poisoned from within with the liberal ideas, the mindset to come under and make the agreement with Rome, without Rome's conversion. It's very serious. Mm -hmm. And also accepting now the Code of Canon Law, the New Code, the legitimacy of the New Mass, the Vatican II is not so bad, religious liberty is not so bad, and these are, it's unbelievable. 
So, a lot of people are growing weary. And some priests even, they don't want to fight anymore. We've been battling all that. Why do we always have to fight the world? Why do we always have to be against the whole world is going this way? Why do we have to swim against the current? And Archbishop Lefebvre said, that's a big temptation for liberal minds. For liberal minds, they want to just get along. Why can't we just get along and go along and go with the flow? Won't it be easier? Wouldn't it be easier? Of course it'd be easier, but we'll flow right with that massive highway to hell. Wide is the road to hell. Many travel thereon. Narrow is the path to heaven. Few there are that find it, our Lord said. And those who find it are those who Stay with what Christ always taught, what the Catholic Church has always taught. It doesn't change. And also to stay with what the Catholic Church has always condemned, traditionally. Religious liberty, false ecumenism, collegiality, freedom of conscience, separation of church and state. And all this is promoted by Vatican II, which means to crucify Christ again. So our Lord wants us now with our boots on and our rifles, and he wants us trudging the trenches. So even you good old ladies, right now, our Lord may want you dying with your combat boots on, <laughs> spiritually, and your rifles in your hand. That's just the way it is. And greater honor to you. And happy will you be if, if from heaven, you know, your, your children, your grandchildren, and your people, you know, kept the faith, so many have got tired of the fight because we haven't even come to blood yet. We haven't even come to the terrible persecutions that will come during the Antichrist. And he will invent new tortures. And he will revive old tortures. So, you know, we think we have it tough now. No, it's not yet. And many of our Catholic ancestors went through a lot of tortures and blood to keep the Catholic faith. So we have to keep fight on and imitate the, the fidelity of Archbishop Lefebvre. You know, he didn't grow tired. He, he was physically tired. But he, he kept flying throughout the world, confirming, strengthening the faithful. And some of you met him. And uh, he, he consecrated four bishops. He, you know, defying modernist Rome. We don't want to follow your Assisi spirit. We want to keep the Catholic faith. So he consecrated four bishops. And now these four bishops, well, it's a sad story now. And we know at least one, though, is doing his duty. Bishop Williamson is doing his duty, confirming, strengthening the faithful to keep the faith. He's traveling. He just came back from Brazil. He's with Father Joe Pfeiffer now in New York City and New Jersey and uh, did confirmations. And uh, how is this possible that one of the four only now is, is doing his duty as a bishop? The rest are being silent about the compromise with Rome. And Bishop Tissier, who knows this is all wrong, pray for him that he will speak out. He has a duty to speak out. He's a bishop. And we cannot put unity above of the society. We all love the Society of Pius X. But we cannot put the unity of the Society of Pius X above the faith. The faith comes before it. And the whole purpose of the SSPX was to keep and defend and bark like dogs against modernism and what will destroy the faith. And to keep the true priesthood and the true mass. So you can't be silent. Because the sheep are being torn up by the wolves, and they're going to sleep. And a lot of faithful are going to sleep. They don't want to fight on. And it's a grave, grave danger to their souls. We, our God wants us to fight. We belong to the church, not the triumphant. That's after the battle. That's after we die, hopefully. God doesn't want us now, right now, in the church suffering. That's purgatory. And they can't help themselves. God wants us now in the church militant. The church militant. That means it's not the church holiday in. 
It's the church militant. We, we, we all got to fight. What are our weapons? It's the same old weapons all our Catholic ancestors fought with. To live in the state of grace, and the devil can't touch you. He can tempt you, but he has no hold on you. Pray the daily rosary. Keep close to frequent confession. To live in the state of grace and keep it. And if you fall, okay, get back up, no problem. And to receive communion with the true Mass often as you can. And make spiritual communions. And know your doctrine. Be informed. Read. Read Archbishop Lefebvre. Read the great traditional popes. Read Father Dennis Fahey. Fill your mind. Too many people wasted a lot of time on filling their mind with a lot of useless data. But we, we need now to fill our mind with what is most important, what pertains to, to know your faith, to know our Lord, to, to know what you must do to save your soul. So let's go to this holy sacrifice. Very soon the same bread with a capital B, Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, will be broken, symbolizing, showing forth his death. And he's really, truly present. Let's ask him when you receive communion to inflame us with his divine fire, to love him above all things, to love him as the martyrs loved him. So they were ready to die for him when they had to. And you have glorious examples. One of them, I'll just close, I promise, this is the last thing. But one glorious example is a beautiful St. Fabronia. St. Fabronia, she was a stunningly beautiful woman. And uh, she lived in the 200s in north of Syria area, kind of in near modern day Turkey. She was a, just a stunningly beautiful woman. And she was an abbess of nuns. She herself slept on a board. She read the Psalms almost many times. They prayed them. They, uh, she fasted much. She prayed much. She did penance much. And when the soldiers came to arrest all the Catholics, they arrested her because she was the abbess. She was betrayed by someone who was learning the catechism, or a friend of his betrayed her. So she was taken and arrested. And she stood there before all these uh, you know, filthy pagan men in the, in the praetorium, in the little coliseum they had. And she stood there, and they told her, look, you're such a beautiful woman. Why are you wasting your life? You could save your life. Just burn a little incense to the Roman gods. You can have any pick of husband you want. You'll, we'll even give you money. We'll even give you a free trip to the Bahamas. Just, just burn a little incense. She said, no, I'm married to the true Christ, the true God. And they said, the, the guy got upset with her and said, look, if you're not going to take the bribes, then we're going to have to torture you. She said, you can torture me all you want. You can put me to death. That won't change my mind. And so to humiliate her, they stripped her in front of all the men. And the, well, the, guy, the guy, one of the head men, just said, you know, aren't you embarrassed? Aren't you ashamed to stand this way before all these men? And she said, don't the athletes strip don't the athletes strip for the competition? She said, I, with my Savior, will compete with you and your father, the devil. And we will triumph over your paganism. And so that made him furious. He had her rolled over broken pottery and glass. He had her uh, cut. Her breasts were cut off. Her teeth were knocked in. Her, some of her face was mutilated. And finally, she was beheaded, St. Yeah. Febronia. So a woman with the strength of a lion, with the strength of an athlete, with the strength of a soldier, and a warrior, and a lion, this is the strength that God gives. And it only comes from God. And she knew that. She knew that. So all the strength, all the faith comes from God. So if we get on our knees and ask from the Mother of God, give us a strong faith, not to fall with compromise, but to stay strong, she will give it to us. She'll put her mantle over you, 
and she will she will guard you, she will protect you, strengthen you. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us to have recourse to thee. Mary, without sin. Pray for us to have recourse to thee. Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us to have recourse to thee. In the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.
Christ. Thank you, Father. Body of Christ. Savior. Blood of Christ. Can you Water from the side of Christ. Wash me. Passion of Christ. Strengthen me. Over Jesus. Hear me. Heal my wounds. Hide me. Suffer me not. From, me. from the evil enemy. Defend me. The hour of my death. Call me. Bid me to call them with thy saints and may be praising thee. Forever and ever. Amen. Behold, O kind and most sweet Jesus. I cast myself on my knees in my sight. And with the most sweet desire of my soul. I pray to see you that thou wouldst impress upon my heart, lively sentiments of faith, charity, which true repentance from my sins and a firm desire for amendment, while seeking perfection and peace of soul. I find within myself an infinite cause of light, like thy most precious and before my eyes the words which speak, prophecy of the Lord Jesus. They have pierced my hands and my feet. They have no for the Pope to consecrate Russia. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory to God. 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 Glory After communion, repeat after me, O oh my God, I believe in Thee. O oh my God, I believe in Thee. Do Thou strengthen my faith. Do Thou strengthen my faith. All my hopes are in Thee. All my hopes are in Thee. Do Thou secure them. Do Thou secure them. I love Thee with my whole heart. Love and love Thee with my heart. Teach me to love Thee daily more and more. Teach me to love Thee daily more and more. I am sorry for having offended Thee. I am sorry for having offended Thee. Do Thou increase my sorrow. Do Thou increase my sorrow. I adore Thee as my first beginning. I adore Thee as my first beginning. I aspire after Thee as my last end. I aspire after Thee as my last end. I give Thee thanks. As my constant benefactor, as my constant benefactor, I call upon thee, to call upon thee, as my sovereign protector, as my sovereign protector. Thou safe, O my God, thou safe, O my God, to conduct me by thy wisdom, to conduct me by thy wisdom, to restrain me by thy justice, to restrain me by thy justice, to comfort me by thy mercy, to comfort me by thy mercy, to defend me by thy power. To thee, I desire, to thee I desire to consecrate all my thoughts, to consecrate all my thoughts words, actions, and sufferings, words, words, actions, and sufferings that, henceforward, that henceforward I may think of thee, I may think think of thee speak of thee, speak of thee and, willingly refer all my actions, and willingly refer all my actions to thy greater glory. To thy greater glory. Suffer willingly. And suffer willingly. Whatever thou shalt appoint. Whatever thou shalt appoint. Lord, I desire that in all things. Lord, I desire that in all things. Thy will may be done. Thy will may be done. Because it is thy will. Because it is thy will. In the manner that thou willest. In the manner that thou willest. I beg of thee. Thee, to enlighten my understanding, to enlighten my understanding, to inflame my will, to inflame my will, to purify my body, to purify my body, to sanctify my soul, to sanctify my soul. Give me strength, O oh my God. Give me strength, O oh my God. To expiate my offenses, to expiate my offenses, to overcome my temptations, to overcome my temptations, to subdue my passions, to subdue my passions, to, my passions. And to acquire the virtues. To acquire virtues. Proper for my state. Proper for my state. Fill my heart with tender affection. Fill my heart with tender affection. 
for thy goodness, for thy goodness. A, hatred for my faults. a hatred for my faults, a love for my neighbor, love love for my neighbor. and contempt for the world. And and the world. world. Let, me Let me always remember to be submissive to my superiors, charitable to my inferiors, faithful to my friends, and indulgent toward my enemies. Assist me to overcome sensuality by mortification, avarice by almsgiving, anger by meekness, and tepidity by devotion. O my God, make me prudent in my undertakings, courageous in dangers, patient in afflictions, and humble in prosperity. Grant that I may ever be attentive in my prayers, temperate at my meals, diligent in my employments, and constant in my resolutions. Let my conscience be ever upright and pure, my exterior modest, my exterior modesty, my conversation edifying, my conversation edifying, and my comportment, comportment regular, and my comportment regular. Assist me, assist me, that I may, may continually labor to overcome nature, that I may continually labor to overcome nature, by corresponding to thy grace, by corresponding to thy grace, to keep thy commandments, to keep thy commandments, to work out my salvation. To work out my salvation. Discover to me, O oh my God, the nothingness of this world, the greatness of heaven, and the shortness of time, and the length of eternity. Grant that I may prepare for death. That I may fear thy judgments, that I may escape hell, and in the end obtain heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and may the souls and all the souls of the faith of God bless in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.